Hello, my name is Roy Knight for Let's Study the Bible Together. Today we will be looking at Acts chapter 18. I certainly hope that you have your Bible. I want you to remember the last time that we were together that Paul was in Athens and Paul had gone up to Mars Hill and taught the congregation there of Jews and Gentiles and there were some who believed and some who did not believe and many of them were attached unto Paul and, and followed. We remember as well that there are some who mocked him and did not. Now, we're in Athens in Acts chapter 17, and as we begin Acts chapter 18 and verse 1, notice what happens. There's a transition of where he's at. Verse 1 says, And after these things that Paul departed from Athens and went to Corinth. Now, we remember that Corinth is where Paul had written two of his letters, 1st and 2nd Corinthians, or is to the Christians who are in Corinth. Whenever we look at this map, I want us to consider that he travels a relatively short distance from Athens. He goes westward just a little bit across the isthmus over to where Corinth is located. But yet Corinth is still a major city that there are a lot of people that are there, and he wants to go there to share the gospel message with them. Again, here's a little bit more detailed map of how far Athens would be from Corinth. And we see that it is a little ways, but yet this is a major seaport. And he wants again to share that gospel with them. Now notice that as we go on into verse 2, that it says, And he found a certain Jew named Aquila, born in Pontus, who had recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla because Claudius had commanded all the Jews to depart from Rome and he came to them. Notice we have Aquila, also we have Priscilla who are two main characters in which we will find in various places throughout the New Testament. We see them in verses 18 of this chapter and also in verse 36 and they're mentioned in other books as well. Notice as well that he is born in Pontus. Now that might not be important until we look at the big picture, but we remember that as Paul is on his second missionary journey, you remember that the Spirit had forbade him to go northwards up into Bithynia and to Pontus and had forbid them to go south into Asia Minor and into Ephesus. Isn't it interesting that he is from Pontus? Could it be that the Spirit forbade him to go northwards because God knew that there would be a man who was from Pontus who would later on share the gospel message up there? We don't know. It's speculation. But remember whenever Paul had made it over to Philippi and there was Lydia, you remember that Lydia was from Thyatira, that area in which the Holy Spirit had forbade Paul to go. And perhaps later on she returned home and taught the gospel to her friends and family around in that area. And so God knows what He's doing. The Holy Spirit knew what He was doing whenever He forbade them to go north and south. Just something to consider. But notice also that Claudius had commanded all of the Jews to depart from Rome. And so we see that in the capital of the Roman Empire that there's some discord and that Claudius has commanded them to leave and so Aquila and Priscilla left. We see as we are looking at secular history that this happened around 51 to 52 AD. Also, there's some speculation here as to whether Aquila and Priscilla are Jews or, or are they Christians at this time. I would speculate that they are Jews because notice in verse 2 it says, and he found a certain Jew named Aquila. And notice again in that same verse that Claudius had compelled all the Jews to depart from Rome. Is it possible that they were uh, Christians and were seen in the eyes of the Romans as far as a sect of the Jews and therefore commanded them to leave as well as all the other Jews? It's possible. However, from verse 2, we see that Jews are brought out twice. The word is used twice. So that they probably are at this time Jews. Later on, we would understand that they would become Christians even though it's not recorded here. In verse 3 it says, So because he was of the same trade, he stayed with them and worked, for by occupation they were 
tent makers. I think that's interesting that by occupation that they were tent makers. And we think about Paul and we think about Paul being very studious and Paul being a Pharisee of Pharisees and into his books. Yet we need to remember that all Jewish uh, children had a trade and by trade he was a tent maker. This was something that he could fall back upon, a skill that had been taught to him whenever he was very young. In verse 4 it goes on to say, And he reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath and persuaded both Jews and Greeks. Notice this word reasoned, and he reasoned in the synagogues. That word reason means to mingle thought with thought or to converse or some would say to argue but simply means to discuss. He is mixing the Bible thought with their thought and trying to persuade them that Jesus is the Christ. So he is reasoning with them. Whenever we are talking to people about Jesus Christ, we need to reason with them and not necessarily to give our thoughts on a particular matter because everyone has an opinion but to go back to God's Word and to share God's Word with them. You know, there's a lot more power whenever they see you opening up the Bible in a Bible study and reading verse for verse what is there. It's no longer you, but it is God's Word that is being brought out. And so he is reasoning with them in the synagogues. Where is he going? He's going back to the Old Testament. He is going to scriptures and he is showing them that through prophecy that Jesus is the Christ. Also notice this word. Not only did he reason with them, but he persuaded them. And that word persuaded means to induce one with words to believe. He is trying to give them a reason for the hope that is within him. He is trying to persuade them to bring them over from their former beliefs to where they need to be in their thinking. So he is reasoning with them. He is persuading them to come and to understand Jesus Christ for who he really is. In the very next verse, in verse 5, it says, when Titus, excuse me, when Silas and Timothy had come from Macedonia, that Paul was compelled by the Spirit and testified to the Jews that Jesus is the Christ. I think that it's interesting that when we see Silas and Timothy as they are coming to find Paul, I wonder how did they find him? You know, they couldn't pick up a cell phone and say, Hey, Paul, where are you? They had to come all the way from Berea, all the way down through Athens, and then over to Corinth. How did they find him as Paul is traveling around? And I wonder if possibly it's not by the people he had converted, that they pointed the, the way. You remember that whenever Paul is in Athens, that there are many who are converted to the Lord. Perhaps they pointed the way over to where he is in Corinth. Isn't that interesting that whenever we go to the Old Testament, we can always say of Abraham that you can trace him by his altar fires, meaning no matter where he went, he was setting up altars and worshiping God. I wonder in this situation, I understand that it's different, I wonder if they couldn't find Paul due to the people in which he had converted. Oh, Paul, yes, we know him. He went on down to Athens. He went to Corinth. And I wonder if they couldn't find him due to the people in which he had converted. I wonder with us as we are preaching the gospel, as we are teaching the gospel to people, can, can people find us in relationship to people in which we have converted? Have we ever taught anyone the gospel? Have we ever shared the gospel with anyone? We need to remember that as Christians, that is our primary duty in this life, is to go and follow that great commission and to share the gospel with people, teaching them and baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and, and teaching them again to observe all things in which God has commanded us. I want us to go on from there and to consider at the middle of this verse. In verse 5 it says, And Paul was compelled by the Spirit. The King James Version uses the phrase that he was pressed 
in the Spirit. In Acts chapter 17 and in verse 16, it says that His Spirit was provoked within Him. His Spirit was provoked within Him. Now, within that context, you remember that Paul is going throughout the marketplaces in Athens and he sees all of these altars that are there to various gods, the various Greek gods that are there, and people are coming and offering their offerings to them. And he sees a city who is carried away in idolatry, and it says that his spirit was provoked within him. Here, whenever he's in Corinth, the same thing happens. Now, looking at various translations, in the New King James Version, it says that Paul was compelled by the Spirit. The implication here is that he was compelled by the Holy Spirit to move and, and, and to talk and to, to preach the gospel. From the King James Version, it brings out that it, he was pressed within his spirit. And those are two different things, the Holy Spirit and Paul's spirit. Whichever one is correct, the important part here is that he felt moved to share the gospel with people. And I wonder as well if we feel moved to share the gospel with people. Are we provoked whenever we go out in our day-to-day -day lives and we see people who are lost? And you remember that most people are lost because Jesus talks about the broad way and the narrow way and He talks about the broad way or the wide way and many there are who, who follow that one but there's a narrow way and few who are, or there are many who follow the broad way and few who follow the narrow way. And when we go out into our communities, do we consider that the people in which we come in contact may be lost? Well, is our spirit provoked within us to share the gospel message with them or to share a track or, or to invite them? Or do we just simply go through our daily routines not even thinking about souls and not even thinking about that there is an eternity that is waiting for each and every one? I would encourage you that as you study the Bible, I want you to note the urgency by which Christian men and women share the gospel of Jesus Christ and that I pray that that seed of urgency will be planted not only in myself but in all of us to share the life-saving message of Jesus Christ. Now, let's go on into the next verse. Next verse says in verse 6, And whenever they opposed him and blasphemed, he shook his garments and said to them, Your blood be upon your own heads. I am clean from now on. I will go to the Gentiles. I will go to the Gentiles. Notice that phrase at the bottom. Was this the first time that Paul would preach the gospel to the Gentiles? The answer to that is no. Well, we ask the question now, why would he say that? From now on I go to the Gentiles if he's already preached the gospel to the Gentiles before. And the answer to that is, you remember that whenever he goes into various cities that he first goes to the synagogue, he goes to the Jews. And here there are Jews who reject him and he says, all right, well that's fine. I'm going to the Gentiles. But remember, he's already preached the gospel to the Gentiles before. In Acts chapter 13 and in verse 46 through 48, it says, And when Paul and Barnabas grew bold and said, It was necessary that the word of God should be spoken to you first, but since you reject it and judge yourself unworthy of everlasting life, behold, we turn to the Gentiles. For so the Lord has commanded us, I have set you as a light to the Gentiles that you should be, for salvation to the ends of the earth. Now whenever the Gentiles heard this, they were glad and glorified the word of the Lord. And so this is not the first time in Acts chapter 18 that he preaches to the Gentiles. He preaches to the Gentiles earlier on. But we're looking at that idea from the specific means to the broad means here. When we're looking at verse 7, it goes on to say, And he departed from there and entered the house of a certain man, named Justus, one who worshiped God, whose house was next door to the synagogue. And so they rejected Paul in the synagogue, and so he goes next door 
to a man named Justice who's next door to it. Now, that is a change in locale. Even though it is a short distance away, he is teaching there, but he's probably staying with Aquila and Priscilla at this time. And so we see him departing, but he is not giving up. He knows that there are many people in that city that need to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so he's not throwing up his hands, and neither should we whenever people reject our message. So many times whenever people reject the message in which we're trying to share with them, we just kind of give up and we go home and, and we don't talk about Jesus anymore. But such was not the mindset of Paul. Paul said, okay, you won't hear about Jesus Christ, but there are others who will. In verse 8 it says, And then Crispus, the ruler of the synagogue, believed on the Lord with all of his household, and many of the Corinthians hearing, believed, and were baptized. This man Crispus is described as the ruler of the synagogue. Now I want us to notice that in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 14, that it says, I thank God that I baptize none of you except for Crispus and Gaius. And so we see that when we're looking at Acts chapter 18 and verse 8, that Paul had baptized him, the ruler of the synagogue. Now that to me is quite impressive. It's impressive in two sense that he was able to do that. Number two, that Crispus was a humble enough man to see the evidence as it was put before him, that Jesus was the Christ, that He was the Savior of the world, and He believed, and He was baptized. Notice again that He is the ruler of the synagogue. Now, when we go down this a few verses in verse 17, it says, Then all of the Greeks took Sosthenes, the ruler of the synagogue. Now think about that. In verse 8, Crispus is the ruler of the synagogue. And he believed and was baptized by Paul. And in verse 17, he's no longer the ruler of the synagogue. That Sosthenes is. Why wasn't Crispus the ruler in verse 17? Well, he was probably fired. Crispus becomes a Christian. And that there are others in that synagogue that say, hey now, you're Christian and we're Jews. And you know what? We no longer have need of you. I want us to consider in this application, would we be willing to put our jobs on the line to obey the gospel of Christ? You know that there are some jobs that just are not appropriate for Christians. A person may be in one of those jobs and, and whenever they're studied with and, and they see that Jesus Christ, it truly is the Son of God and they want to hear and believe and, and be baptized, well they understand that they can't continue in that particular job. What are they going to do? You know, Crispus could have said, you know, I like being ruler of the synagogue and I understand that Jesus uh, is the Christ, but I'm not going to follow him because I like my position. But it wasn't like that. He gave up that position to follow Christ and it may be that some of you may need to give up that position in order to follow Christ. I'm not saying that everyone does, but if it is an occupation that is inconsistent with godly values, then yes, maybe so. Maybe you need to give that up in order to follow the Lord. I want us to consider as well, when we're looking at this same verse in Acts chapter 18 and in verse 8, notice that the Corinthians hearing, believed, and were baptized. You remember that faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. And that hearing the Word of God, that people believe it, and then by necessity we need to do something. Now I understand that there are many people who say, well, we don't have to do anything at all, that all we have to do is believe and we're saved, but the Bible simply does not teach that. There are a lot of denominations in the world who do, but the Bible does not teach that. 
Do you remember that whenever we're looking back in Scripture, that in Acts chapter 2, that whenever people were pricked in the heart and then they asked Peter and the apostles, Ben and brethren, what shall we do? Peter told them exactly what they needed to do. And the implication here is that there's something in which we all need to do if we are to come in contact with God's saving grace. And you remember in Acts chapter 2 and verse 41 that 3,000 souls upon hearing that word were immersed in the water. They were baptized. Why? For the remission of their sins. You see, people cannot be saved until their sins are washed away. And their sins are only washed away whenever they are immersed into water. Have you done that? Are you willing to do that? Do you want to go to heaven? And I'm sure that your answer would be, yes, I want to go to heaven. But the question is, is, will we follow the teachings of the denominations or will we follow the teachings of the Bible? Will we follow the teachings of Jesus Christ? And, and there may be a pull there between the two. Well, what should I do? I've always been taught this. But now I see that the Bible teaches this. You always have to decide on the side of the Bible, do you not? Because the gospel is the power of God to salvation and we need to follow the examples of the New Testament. These Corinthians, whenever they heard the gospel message, heard it, they believed it, and they were immersed. They were baptized. This is exactly what we need to do today in order to receive the forgiveness or the remission of our sins as well. We have looked at Acts from chapter 1 all the way up to this chapter and noting that every time that a person becomes a Christian, it is always by that same process, hearing and believing, repenting as well, we understand, and being immersed into water. Now. The very next verse goes on to say, in verse 9, it says, Now the Lord spoke to Paul in the night by a vision. Do not be afraid, but speak and do not keep silent, for I am with you and no one will attack you to hurt you, for I have many people in this city. The question here is, could it be that Paul was afraid? A lot of times we don't think about Paul being afraid. We always think about Paul being fearless and, and going and preaching the message. But the question here is that I want to pose to you, why would God tell Paul, don't be afraid, if he wasn't afraid? It doesn't make sense, does it? Is it possible that Paul here, seeing the opposition that was brought on by the gospel, was afraid at this time? I think so. For God to say, do not be afraid, He says, but speak and do not keep silent. There is a temptation or a tendency for us to be afraid, is it not? To share the gospel with others. But I think the guy would tell us the exact same thing. Don't be afraid because fear shuts us up. It shuts our mouths up and we don't want to share the gospel. But in order for people to be saved, we have to overcome that fear in order to share it. You remember even the apostles earlier on in the book of Acts prayed for boldness. And it may be that we need to do the exact same thing. Could it be that Paul was tempted to be silent? I think so. Because God is saying, don't be silent, Paul, for I have many people in the city. Could it be that Paul was afraid of being hurt? Notice what it says again, and no one will attack you to hurt you. Well, it may be that we are afraid of all of these things. However, however, the God in which we serve is greater than all of these things. He encouraged Paul to keep on keeping on and he would encourage us to do the exact same thing. Verse 11 says, and he continued there a year and six months teaching the word of God among them. A year and six months. Usually we think about Paul going from one place to the next place to the next place right quickly, but we see that that is not true. In verses 12 through 13 it says, 
when Gallio was proconsul of Achaia, that the Jews with one accord rose up against Paul and brought him to the judgment seat, saying, This fellow persuades men to worship God contrary to the law. Notice this whenever Gallio was proconsul of Achaia. You know, we actually have evidence that he was actually there at that time. A lot of folks say, well, we just don't have the evidence. Well, the evidence is right before us. All we have to do is look at it. Look for the evidence. And we can find it in archaeology all the time. Here is the Gallio stone. His name is written there as being proconsul, which was found at Delphi, which was not too far away from Corinth. Also, notice that it talks about the judgment seat, that he was brought to the judgment seat or to the Bema, B-E-M-A. Now, what is that? It is a place by which judgment was rendered by the proconsul, and this mob of people bring Paul to this judgment seat to be judged, and that is still in existence today. Of course, not in its glory in which it was 2,000 years ago, but you can go to that exact same place today by which Paul stood in trial. In verses 14 and following it says, And whenever Paul was about to open his mouth, Gallio said to the Jews, If it were a matter of wrongdoing or wicked crimes, O Jews, there would be reason why I should bear with you. But if it is a question of words and names in your own law, Look to it yourselves, for I do not want to be a judge in such matters. Verse 16 and 17 goes on to say, And he drove them from the judgment seat. Then all the Greeks took Sosthenes, the ruler of the synagogue, and beat him before the judgment seat. But Gallio took no notice of these things. And that concludes the section in which we're looking at today. And so we see that there's a lot going on here. And I think that it is interesting that Crispus obeyed the gospel message. If he had not obeyed the gospel message, it might have been him that was beaten in verse 17. But he obeyed. The question is, will you obey the gospel of Jesus Christ? Will you hear? Will you believe? And will you be baptized. If you're interested in doing that, why not contact those at GBM? Why not contact those here at St. Andrew's Road or even myself? And we would love to speak to you about your salvation. I certainly hope that you will be with us next time as we pick up in the very next verse and we see what happens again in Corinth. Thank you very much for your time.